Hi, everyone, and welcome back to the short interviews uh, with Hypret and me, Goran Svetanovsky. Today with us, we have uh, an awesome, actually, person, a person that I know for many years now. That is Dr. Shell Carlson, Head of Data Science Strategy at Domino Data, Data Lab. And um, we spoke last week and we decided, like, okay, let's uh, run uh, a two-part session uh, on um, generative AI. So the first one, which is this one, we'll be focusing a little bit more on uh, generating the hype and uh, does everybody need a generative AI strategy? Well, the second one will be a little bit more about making generative AI work in your organization and how to operationalize it within your company. So, uh, Chell, I'm very, very, very happy to have you um, with us today. Uh, it's a true honor and um, I look forward to this uh, discussion. I think it's going to be amazing. It's a very important topic. It's a very hot topic right now. And uh, yeah, thank you for being with us. Goran, thank you very much for having me. Yeah. So um, sh maybe we should start with, um, maybe we should start actually just explaining what generative AI is, just to put it there, and then we can go, um, then we can go into the depth of it. What do you think? Oh, certainly. When it comes to artificial intelligence, uh, usually the, the most important thing is when it comes to terminology. Can we align on what it is we're talking about? Because usually people are, uh, are often saying uh, things that are exactly right. They're just talking about different things and they never overcome that. Um, and artificial intelligence as a whole suffers from that problem because we all anthropomorphize it and we're all referring to different parts of the ecosystem. But generative AI is even messier because it's one of those things where actually a lot of the core valuable use cases in generative AI aren't actually generative. So sometimes we're talking about a particular technology and architecture, and sometimes we're talking about a particular set of use cases. And I think it's more helpful to talk about what's unique about the architecture. And that is the, uh, these transformer encoder decoder models. Uh, it's a type of deep learning, which is artificial neural networks. Um, but they came about with an invention around 2017. And these have really unlocked the ability, certainly to generate um, human-like behaviors, uh, like the ability to, to go in and generate text, generate voice, generate images and video in a way that really we couldn't do before. But they've also just opened up this world of understanding language in a way that, that we we, we couldn't do before. We, we had recurrent neural networks, we had LSTMs, if you remember those ones, but they didn't paralyze and so they were quite limited. What happened with in 2017 with these transformers is all of a sudden, oh my goodness, this thing just, uh, that, that one um, invention, those attention mechanisms that they came up with at that, at that time, just transformed what we can do in terms of understanding unstructured data and creating unstructured data. And uh, fast forward, we come to 2023, March, and then... Uh... Exactly. I mean, it's one of those things where it's like, well, so why did it take so long? I mean, it's not like uh, those in the data science community weren't banging the drums and saying, like, look at these incredible things I can do with this BERT model. Um, and it, sort of, it, it goes back to the whole, well, it's not just a technology. There's also a social phenomenon that's, that's in this. I mean, the same thing happened in 2012, right, with, with ImageNet and when convolutional neural networks came along. Um, it wasn't just that, oh, uh, we can do these things. It was also that executives were like, oh, but, you know, I've got Siri on my phone and I've got Alexa devices at home, so artificial intelligence must be real. And then it turned out, well, that mm, gave... Yeah, that, that let down a rabbit hole. But then this, the next thing happened, of course, was chat GPT, which uh, it took, uh, I mean, the, the demos with chat GPT, I mean, they're obviously, they're amazing, but, you know, the folks over at OpenAI were doing similar demos, like, two years earlier. Uh, mm. but what happened was that, you know, Microsoft funded this, and they made it really easy for folks to consume. They created a killer app around generative AI that put it in the hands of everyone. And so now every executive, uh, grandma, school kid, you name it, could now go and play with this and realize, oh my goodness, this, this stuff is really, really powerful. I want the, the era of revolution must be real. What can I do with this? So there is that sociological aspect of it's not good enough just to have that, the, that, that technological breakthrough. It's also to have it burst into the, the public consciousness and help everybody in the business community realize that, oh no, now it's different. Now it's real. Maybe we should be doing something with this. Right, right. 
Um, and I truly believe that basically the, the, the killer app and the way how you can interact with the artificial intelligence uh, that was uh, released by OpenAI with the chat GPT was something new because we discussed about generative AI and LLM so like quite a long time ago, but you know, that never reached the, the board meeting and suddenly, you know, kids and executives are utilizing uh, AI and they can feel the power of it and suddenly, pow, there it is. Yeah. Well, and so, I mean, it makes it so that right now we have an incredible opportunity in the data science community to go in and take advantage of this, this interest and this excitement. They, they don't, they don't come around that, that, that frequently. I mean, you can only imagine for the folks who were studying artificial intelligence back in like the, what is it, the 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s, how envious they are of all of us who are now in this space where it's like, well, yes, it is kind of unsettling to be a data scientist and all of a sudden be thrust in front of the CEO to explain what your generative AI strategy is. But on the other hand, you have the opportunity to be in front of the CEO and explain what your generative AI strategy is. You have a, an opportunity to go in and take advantage of all of that excitement and enthusiasm. And that's often a pretty defined period of time. And you know, we don't have forever in order to make good on this process and on this. We, we need to go and show value off of this so that we can sustain a virtuous cycle of, of um, adoption and investment uh, and success and impact because otherwise, you know, we're going to go, we're gonna go the, the route of earlier generations of, you know, advanced analytics is going to change the business. Oh, it didn't really. You know, I mean, certain things. Big data is going to change the business. <laughs> well, didn't, really. right. Right. <laughs> didn't, didn't really. So we, we can't let this happen with generative AI. And it is such a more... <laughs> accessible to a certain extent technology than the others that we we have this opportunity to drive rapid value and finally set a light that 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 spark that revolution um that um, transforms the business around these technologies versus being this thing which is it's it, it putters forward it, it grows but not to the degree that we all know that it can be transformative in the organization right and uh, then it uh, brought something new which was actually now we have two AI to think about. One is like the applied AI or the old AI, and now you have generative AI, right? Yeah, I mean, that is the, that is the problem of uh, folks then assuming that every use case that you go after must be a generative AI use case, that everything that we do with this technology needs to be a chatbot. Um, and well, um, there are there are certainly generative AI use cases which we can implement quickly and which are broadly applicable. And there are certainly generative AI use cases which are transformative and can act on core parts of our business. But, you know, there's still, they're comparatively untested. They're still fairly, fairly narrow in terms of the, what the well-defined use cases are that we can, we can go after versus the giant plethora of all of the traditional According to AI, the machine learning, the machine learning use cases, the advanced analytics use cases that we have, that we also don't want to over rotate and make this uh, all about no, no, we, this is it, we're all we're all in on generative AI. We're going to uh, ignore uh, the the those other valuable use cases because those other valuable use cases. Uh, those are reliable. Those are our bread and butter. Uh, we need to be doing more of those. So. I was talking to a, uh, a head of data science at one of the large uh, British uh, banks uh, two, uh, a couple of weeks ago, and um, what he was saying is that you know we're we're we're, we're it's about like a ten percent ninety percent split. I think he's probably exaggerating. It's probably about five percent ninety five percent split for most organizations, or even maybe less towards the where the five percent or less is generative AI. Uh, but we're using this as a way of telling folks, wait, you're really excited about AI? Let me talk about generative AI. Let me talk to you about all of the other ways that we are already driving business and all of the ways that we can further drive business, not just with the generative AI, uh, generative AI technology, we're doing those as well, but with this broad portfolio of different technologies and use cases that we can go after that we should always have been going after. Um, right. So, you know, do it now. Yeah, there was um, a dear friend of uh, mine, Robert Walton, who is uh, leading the, the, the analytics in Volvo group. Uh, he uh, wrote to me, a couple of weeks ago back, uh, or actually we were commenting on a post on LinkedIn and he mentioned something, he says like, uh, all problems deserve AI. Uh, sorry, you can solve all the, uh, all the challenges with AI, but not every challenge deserves an AI, right? Mm -hmm. Meaning like, uh, meaning like, uh, you don't have to 
utilize AI for everything, or at least generative AI in that case. Um, now, very shortly, so how would you define the, 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 defini uh, the definition or um, how would you explain the difference between uh, traditional or applied AI, what we have been working until now, what companies have been preparing for for the past seven, eight years, 10 years actually, and generative AI, which is very new right now, and what would be the, the how would you use it? Maybe that is a better question. Mm. Well, I find it helpful to think about the type of data. You know, sooner or later, it's usually good to start with the data. And the big difference between traditional machine learning methods that we had, it's like, well, yes, uh, uh, my, please forgive the gross oversimplification, was that they were primarily good at structured data. Um, <clears throat> versus the generative AI methods that we're using today are primarily for unstructured data, both in terms of understanding it as well as then for creating it. So if you're going after use cases which are leveraging, you know, your your standard structured um, uh, analytics databases, those I've, are you're, you're not going to be leveraging for the most part a um, a neural network to begin with, um, uh, except. In particular circumstances, you're probably going to be using a, um, an XG boost model uh, or even an aggression model if you need more, more transparency behind it. Um, you're going to be using more traditional methods on them. What really is new here is the opportunity to go in and both analyze that unstructured data. So think of all of your document databases, your enterprise content management system, all of those written notes in your, uh, in your CRM solution, your uh, HRM solution, uh, et cetera. Um, being able to now uh, leverage that data and make that available to folks, um, but then also combine that with a natural language interface to it. So the natural language interface, which then can help you generate, again, uh, text, conversations, um, uh, images, video, uh, uh, et cetera, from it. So I, I see the big split between them as being, again, it's an oversimplification between your a traditional structured data use cases, and now this opportunity around text, images, video, et cetera, that for the most part, enterprises have really underexploited in terms of both their ability to work with that data, but then that ability to create and generate experiences that leverage text and voice and images. Now, I know that's right. very large. Um, we can go into like the more specific use cases that we're actually seeing most companies go after these days. So that'd be helpful. Right. We will come back to that. But um, to come back to the point, so I wanted to make like a differentiation because the, the, the first question actually is why should enterprises and companies care about generative AI or creating like a generative AI strategy on how to use generative AI in the organization. Why not simplistically uh, having an AI strategy or a applied strategy? Why uh, they should care about generative AI? Well, and I guess the answer of that is is yes, in the sense of that they should both be um, talking about this in a combined way, but at the same time carving out a specific strategy that's around generative AI. And the, I guess the reason I would say of why you would want a specific strategy around generative AI is because it can help you go in and unlock the value that's trapped in uh, your own unstructured data as well as the unstructured data in other organizations. So probably the single biggest use case that uh, most frequent use case that I'm seeing companies go after right now is going and taking something like your documentation database or your, um, uh, if you're in the research side, patent databases, um, all, all of your, all of your, all of your company contracts and documents, and now connecting that with a chatbot uh, question answering uh, virtual assistant on top of it that can help you now use all of that data. And so the, the having a generative AI use uh, strategy per se forces you to go in and start working with that unstructured data and thinking about the new ways that you can leverage this. Because otherwise, again, these data sources are ones that the data science teams, uh, business leaders and others just aren't very familiar with how they should be using. Most We haven't really had the opportunity, the possibility to go in and use these data sources at scale and create these new kind of experiences. So having a, a separate strategy forces you to think about that and, and, and tackle it in a way that you'd just be too tempted to put it to the side because it's, it's hard, it's new, it's untested. Um, but at the same time, the, you, you mustn't 
completely carve this out because it is another form of AI technology. It has the same challenges. A lot of the same teams are going to be involved in it. And the investments that you make on the generative AI side are going to benefit everything that you're doing on the on, on the tra quote unquote, traditional AI side of things as well. I mean, the, the ML ops challenges that you face on generative AI, so-called LLM ops, are there there's a there's there are some slight differences to them but for the most part they're mlops challenges on steroids so you want to you don't want to disconnect right. these because there's too many complementarities between them but at the same time if you don't have any separate generative AI strategy, there's just too much of a risk that you'll resort, resort to organizational inertia. You won't be able to power through and deliver on these ones and, and spark that virtuous cycle. All right. So, um, so would you say that uh, a generative AI strategy sh is, uh, should be, or is it different from having a, NDS, uh, a DSML or data science machine learning strategy or a general AI uh, general AI strategy, let's call it, um, in the company? Should this be different or as a part of it? I think it should definitely be part of it, but it should be a very clearly um, delineated part of the strategy um, for this, uh, the, the reasons I was saying before. It does have different enough characteristics that, um, and again, experimental use cases, that if if you don't, Again, it's just too likely that they will be put to the side the, um, uh, versus, versus the traditional ones, and you'll be, you'll be left behind. But at, again, at the same time, you're not doing anybody a favor by splitting them off entirely separately. I mean, heaven forbid. The, I mean, the, the real worry is that you're now going to start replicating separate organizational structures for generative AI, and that would be... That would be a calamity uh, because right. they're just going to re they redis <laughs> rediscover the the same problems of operationalizing uh, generative AI models that uh, that you've already you've learned again. those lessons you've already started building those the, those those platforms um, for when it comes to uh, a traditional AI. Right. So generative AI, I think that the first time when we heard the word a little bit like uh, like this, it was last year with the images and now with ChatGPT and now suddenly everybody is talking about it. we are just basically talking with the market right now, preparing for the, the projects uh, uh, for the upcoming uh, months and the and next year as well. And it turns just and it every time we speak with some organization, it turns out that they're talk, uh, they're working with LLM, right, and generative AI. So uh, it seems like everybody is working on it, but what is in your, uh, um, let's say, where would you put the maturity of enterprise generative AI at this point of time? How do you, where would you say organizations are at this point of time? Yeah, I guess I would say that right now they're just exiting panic mode. I think for the last couple of months, everybody's been in, oh my goodness, what? How do I stop folks from uh, putting in sensitive data, PII, into a a, a third party model that um, uh, that uh, that that will completely violate our data governance strategies? Is going to get us in trouble with regulators, um, et cetera, et cetera. So right now has just been a, a defensive. Okay, how do I uh, enable some kind of safe version of this uh, for 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 users or train users so that we don't go in and start putting in our intellectual property or our PII into these uh, uh, often free third, uh, available third party uh, services, which ChatGPT is is probably the, uh, right. the the number one offender on on that kind of front. Yes, they do have their own solutions, but that doesn't mean folks are using those. <clears throat> right. So we're, yeah, we're just as aggressive now in the market. They're approaching the, the enterprises, you know, with the enterprise oh. uh, solution. Yes, very yes. much. So. Well, they need, they need to have something to show for that uh, that very uh, for all of the money that they've been getting from uh, from the Microsoft side to go in and make this available for free. Uh, it, it's all good. I mean, glad they're yeah. doing it. But so the the next the phase that folks are increasingly in is is really the experimentation phase. It's the okay. Well, what right. should we be using this for? Um, and there, obviously, the great thing about generative AI is just the degree to which. Uh, you can experiment. You can get a sense of the art of the possible. You can create minimum viable products so quickly. Uh, the problem is, is that you then immediately run into the operationalization problem. And there's such a disconnect between uh, what you would be doing in order to create that MVP and how you'd go about operationalizing it that right now, folks, once, once they hit that wall, it, it's, it, is a, it is more of a, of a wall, more of a chasm, a cliff to fall off of than with... Uh, 
with traditional AI AI technologies. Because you know, sure, great, we created this MVP with uh, uh, on you know 137 billion parameter model, uh, and guess what? There's 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 no way that you're going to be able to operationalize that. It's too it's too expensive. Its latency is, is too high. Um, <clears throat> uh, the 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 folks you can get most of those ultra large models for are not going to give you uh, give you the model so that there are IP risks around it. Um, <clears throat> but above all, again, you just cannot go in and um, and operationalize it, both from the point of time you just can't hit it, uh, literally can't inference quickly enough for it and uh, and cheaply enough to do it. But then there's also the, the challenge of a lot of these generative AI applications require much more complicated, larger pipelines and workflows than you would use on a traditional machine learning model. Because now it's a, well, you're, you're taking your incoming data, you're often, you know, you're going putting that through various embedding models, you're putting that in a vector database, you're extracting that from a vector database, you're going and putting this into often the same model multiple, multiple times, trying to get some consensus of it, taking those and then uh, jamming it into another model uh, in order to go in and, and refine it and process it before it gets to, it gets to, uh, it gets to a person. And that's just a simple uh, uh, pipeline and workflow. Um, so <laughs> it was challenging enough just to operate operationalize one of those models, now you need to orchestrate all of those. And well, occasionally you'll be able to access a model as a service. I um, can't believe that I'm saying that term these days, um, given the history of that term and how AI as a service has not worked previously. But anyway, forget that. Um, it, it's hard enough to get access to those the right now. Then there's a challenge of, well, how do I orchestrate this What's growing ecosystem of different ra rapidly um, uh, evolving components uh, and then support all of this with an infrastructure which is massively more computationally intensive than anything I've seen before. So that jump from a, oh, great, I can use one of these services and I can create that MVP to now the, okay, well, then how am I going to do this for real? Um, it's almost, I, I believe strongly that Leveraging those services for the MVP is actually taking you down a rat hole. It, it's tending you down a dead end. And actually, it's better for organization. I'm, I'm increasingly seeing more organizations now start with a much smaller open source model, try out a bunch of different open source models, right. uh, try and define the... the um, the, the, the set of use cases, narrow down the scope, the tasks, um, and, uh, uh, build that MVP up from there. I'm seeing folks be more successful for with versus taking an ultra large model that can do all of these incredible things really quickly. Um, and, and then work your way back to how you're going to operationalize it. But, you know, we're going to be doing both. Uh, all right. But, so experiment, mm -hmm. experimentation, um, maturity, mode, let's call it like that. Um, I concur with you because uh, the most of the companies that I, that I hear and talk to that are saying that they're, they have, um, gotten some kind of a value out of generative AI so far, uh, so, um, so forth, uh, has been companies that have been experimenting with, uh, open source models, um, and implementing that with the uh, internal processes in order to, to, um, uh, to make them yes. smoother or, or to automize them and etc. So, uh, well, but and a lot of those companies started before um, before the the, the jet, Chat GPT uh, um, right. um, mind blowing event or what we should, however we should refer to it. That 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 mm. point in time. Um, I mean, thinking of Novo Nordisk now, who's uh, and a lot of other folks in the pharma space who are leveraging generative models uh, when it comes Since to pandemic, designing yeah. synthetic peptides. Um, and, you know, they've been doing this for several years now, uh, working off of LLMs with a, a BERT style architecture and, 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 and training those. Uh, so I mean, they got, they got started with this when really there were only, um, open source models, uh, available for them to start using. And mm -hmm. hence they've, they've, uh, they've, uh, had to deal with that problem of operationalizing in them from the very get go. Yeah. But still, it brings us to the topic of value, right? Because we talked about should they care about generative AI? You know, should they approach this from a, a different perspective, not on the, uh, only their uh, data science, machine learning, AI type of a strategy? Um, we talked about that we are in a starting phase. We are still in the, uh, we are exiting the panic mode, entering the experimentation. Um, in my conversation, and you can see online, there is a lot of companies saying that they have received value already with this type of a um, technology. But 
what is your opinion uh, looking at the customers and the people that you talk to? How do you see the perception of value so far? Are people getting value out of it? Yes, I think it's helpful to split it into two different types of uh, use cases, because there is a type of use case with generative AI that we haven't had before, which is just the one of ad hoc usage by, a, uh, by an individual user. So now going in and leveraging one of those giant models to go in and uh, create a performance evaluation or first draft of a performance evaluation, create a first draft of a strategy document, all of those kind of things. Those were things that we never could do in the, in the AI space previously. So there are a range of these use cases, which are, they're very ad hoc, they're very generic, um, and they're really just trying to augment a, an expert user to get, um, uh, to get over, uh, over that hump. Um, so it's like, uh, helping a, uh, insurance claims uh, um, approver to go in and create that first draft of uh, of the of the of the letter that they need to generate to somebody explaining why it is that they've approved or or um, or rejected a claim, and that there's uh, that you can you can create a head start for and uh, for one of those individuals and one of those individuals that they're often very they're expensive highly trained individuals and so to the degree that you're saving them 15 minutes 5 minutes on a regular basis that value adds up so there's a set of use cases which are really very ad hoc they're 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 not going to be transformative for your business because you you, you know you've already delivered about as much of the value well you delivered a good amount of the value that you can there. Again, there's not enough regularity consistency for you to, to go in and, and automate a lot of those. For those ones, folks are, are seeing value straight off the bat. It's the, the other ones which are where you're now creating an, an application. You're creating, you're going after use case that is repeated, that is differentiated, that is um, core to your business. Those are the ones that are going to be transformative with generative AI. Those are the ones like uh, on the pharma side of things where folks are changing their process for, de for developing new, um, new kinds of treatments. Um, and there it, it's, it's very specific. It's folks who are, uh, tend to be going after um, an existing process that they're doing, which is very manually intensive and difficult and, and automating that. So again, the pharma side, but it is increasingly folks who are then on like the insurance side or the research side of things where they are then uh, have these needs to go and create uh, and do uh, research reports and other things that are very time intensive for very expensive folks. So Currently, I'm seeing that as the bifurcation. It's the, the, the ones in the middle, though, are the ones that we're all most excited about. They're the, well, can't we create this, this universe of small generative AI applications fairly quickly and easily and um, make those available? And that's where I think we're still trying to work that out. And there, there are a couple, there's some successes, some failures. There's, there, they tend to be internal use cases, like going in and creating a chatbot in terms of a, on a document database or creating first draft generators for, for standard tasks uh, of things that folks are using. Um, uh, and so right now, it's still on those extremes. It's uh, getting value from completely ad hoc, one-off things that folks are they're, they're, they're doing, um, or going in and, and embedding these into uh, core processes, va extremely valuable processes in the organization and, and, automating, and automating those. And it's in the middle where we're still fairly early on because it is so difficult to go in and operationalize those ones in between. For the, for the first ones, fairly easy to operationalize because we don't have to do much. For the, for the ones that are most transformative, they're so valuable that we're going to overcome the challenges of, of operationalization. We're going to invest in those. It's the ones in the middle whereby the operationalization challenge is really large. And so we're not getting, it's, uh, we need to overcome a lot. We need to show a lot of value in order to get those, uh, get those done. But once we, once we get better at the, that LLM ops, that, that, that ability to operationalize, that's, I think, what will... Um, really enable um, that proliferation of use cases to bloom. All right. Um, let's talk about talent a bit. So let's say that you are an organization and you're developing a generative AI strategy and uh, you want to deploy generative AI uh, technology within your enterprise. Um, do you need a special type of a competence or is that a competence can be found already in your data science, ML, um, AI type of a uh, um, department that you already have? Hmm. 
It's a, it's a tough question, um, and to a certain extent, it's still in flux. Um, when it comes to generative AI talent broadly, there's so little of it. Right? There's so few folks um, uh, were, were trained on this as data scientists that, you know, how many folks really have hands-on, very significant hands-on experience fine-tuning an LLM, for example? Not very many. But thankfully, you can learn a lot of that. There's increasingly good materials around that. And a lot of the data scientists that are out there have been, they've been experimenting with this already. So there's not a, it's, it's very unclear that there's much to be gained by going out and trying to, to hire folks who have significant experience with LLMs. There's just too few of them. There's in huge demand right now. They're too expensive. Um, for most organizations, you're not going to have the luxury of being able to hire somebody who has significant experience on that, on, on that front. So on the data science side of things, yes, your data scientists are as good as you are going to get for the most part in terms of who's going to generate drive this for you. Now, that being said, there is a set of capabilities, though, which you're going to need a lot more of. And again, that is on the, the DevOps for, for, for AI, the, the MLOps, the, the machine learning engineers, folks who understand how to um, uh, <clears throat> provision infrastructure, set up custom environments, go in and ingest uh, LLMs from, from different sources and create um, uh, specialized containers, um, uh, uh, both for the development environments with the with uh, with the, the libraries and models and architectures that you need that then work on the infrastructure that you need to scale it on. Those, I think, are folks that you're going to need a lot more of that um, that organizations just don't have enough of, but who do exist out in the market. So if you can find folks who are skilled on the MLOps side of things, those folks are going to be in very high demand. And you know, if you're in a data science pro uh, program right now or anything like that, and you have a choice of, of what to be spending your time on, I would spend a lot of time on the what was traditionally the least interesting aspects of it, which were the uh, the the MLOps, the the DevOps for 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 AI side of of things, because that skill is in huge demand right now, um, and is unique and difficult enough um, uh, for for folks to folks to come by. Now there is another another job category that I've received a lot of inquiries from from journalists and others right now, and that's around the prompt engineer. Should we be right. hiring prompt yes. engineers, and do these exist? And I'm very skeptical uh, about that as a job. I the the similar the transferable skills from one model to another model, from the type of prompt that you're creating from one from one use case to another. I don't think it's there's enough there, and my expectation is is that unfortunately that's going to be a very low value added skill in the future. And there probably are folks who are going to be prompt engineers, but they're probably going to be paid, you know, on the same well, hopefully a little bit better, but probably not that much better than the folks who are doing data annotation and labeling right now. So uh, yes, it, right now maybe it can exist as 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 a, as a job for a little bit, but I don't think it's going to exist for for long because it's just too too undifferentiated a skill. Um, Maybe like for, a transition, a, tra transitioning uh, job in between. Yeah, I don't know. exactly. Once organizations have a little better sense of it. And part of this is because so much of the value lies in the intersection of prompt engineering with domain-specific skill. Um, so it'd be a little bit like saying, uh, my job is a, is a, a, a Googler. I, I spend all my time on, on internet search engines. And what I am is a professional internet searcher. Um, and, you know, obviously in a lot of our jobs, it can feel like that. I mean, if you're an investment banker or a management consultant, it can certainly feel like that. But the value doesn't come in from being able to do an internet search. The value be comes in from being able to do an internet search with you also being a, a highly, highly qualified individual in your particular domain. Like my, I have pathologist friends who say, you know, they're spending a lot of time on Google. The value isn't because they can use Google. The value is because they can apply their pathology related knowledge to the, res right. the results that they get from Google. And it's going to be a little bit similar when it comes to prompt engineering. I think we're all going to need to know prompt engineering, whether we, well, I think a lot of us already, already are becoming pretty, pretty decent with it. Um, and every, I think everybody will, will absolutely need that as a skill. But it's not a job in itself. It is an augmenting skill for all of the traditional roles that, that we, we tend to be in.
Right. So let's assume that you are you are you you're leading a team of data science, machine learning, AI resources in uh, in organization. How much of your resources, or um, let's say all the power that you have, would you dedicate to generative AI these days um, versus uh, traditional data science, machine learning projects? Uh, I would probably, it's it's going to be a very rough estimate. It's going to be a swag no matter what. And it's going to vary, obviously, depending on what uh, what kind of industry that you're in. Um, and some factors that affect it are just the degree to which you have those highly talented individuals who are spending a lot of their time either combing through unstructured data or generating unstructured data. So folks who are either reading a lot of reports uh, or and writing a lot of reports. If you're in one of those ones, you're going to be increased, you're going to up that percentage ratio. But I would, I would go back to what I've been hearing from, uh, from the, those heads of data science who are saying that, you know, five to 10% of, uh, of their, of their overall efforts are being focused on the generative AI side of things. It's just a very visible, uh, five to 10% of, <laughs> of their, uh, of, of, of their efforts. But if you are on, if you're on the legals, if you're in the legal industry, uh, if you are in investment banking, if you are in, uh, in, in pharma in particular, um, I think that number uh, that number starts ticking upwards. Generally, if you have a lot of folks who are researchers or look like researchers, you're going to want to beef that number up. And you know, twenty to thirty percent isn't isn't unthinkable for uh, for those kinds of organizations. I have a hard time envisioning anybody going above that unless there are a startup who is going after this particular uh, creating a generative AI based. Um, uh, based application, obviously that's a different, different, uh, different kettle of fish. Uh, or if you're in an industry, which is very specifically looking like it's going to be disrupted by this. So, you know, if you're in right. marketing content, then, you know, this is, um, you, at front and center of, of what it is you do. If you're, if you're a, a podcast, uh, recording platform owner, uh, um, uh, vendor, then being able to add in those generative AI based uh, uh, abilities to go in and create those trans uh, text tra uh, transcripts, go in and suggest edits, go in and uh, automatically translate into other languages, uh, all of those kind of things, then That's your okay. number is going to be a lot higher. Yeah, right. Is there any particular industry that you see that is investing or working uh, more on generative AI right now than uh, the rest? Hmm. I'm completely biased by the organizations that are that are our customers, which tend to be very regulated industries. Um, yeah. But certainly, with on the pharma side of things and biotech side of things, uh, I'm I'm hearing it nonstop. Um, uh, when it comes to uh, on, again on the insurance side of things, uh, and for a lot of the the customer interaction side of things, uh, hearing it very very frequently there as well. Um, there are certain industries where I would love for this, where this has so much potential. And if you take something like education, for example, education has the potential to be completely, completely transformed with generative AI. I agree. And I'm skeptical of that happening anytime soon, at least not in the large, uh, maybe for yes. adult education and professional education and, and, uh, uh, and things like that. But in terms of, large state run school systems and other things like that who would totally benefit from these or even you know traditional undergraduate universities that would totally benefit from these uh, is just too yeah, much of a history uh, that taking I, really yeah, long time. I think I think that that opens a, a rabbit hole that uh, it's it takes a little bit longer than this podcast to discuss because you know, <laughs> it's the entire educational system I think so <laughs> I have a but, but a change yeah. a change management uh, is is core of this exactly. thing. How hard is it to change your process to go after this? And uh, underlying change management is the is the is following the money is the is the financial incentive. Right. Who has the real the largest financial incentive to overcome that change management problem? Um, and on education side of things, for the most part, they don't have that um, the, that that incentive isn't isn't there enough uh, broadly speaking. But so then it is well. Now that we look across different organizations, where where is that? And you know, VCs. Uh, I could strongly imagine um, the the uh, being. Um, uh, I know some. A lot of them are investing heavily in this. Um, and 
Well, it's not just because they're investing in it for uh, as startups. They're also investing it for their own internal usage because I the mean, potential the, the, there from the money the side best, is huge. The best thing to invest is in change, right? That is the only thing that is constant. So if you don't do it, that is what it is. I believe that we are right now in some kind of a same time as the 90s where people are basically educated to work with the internet and computers and people need to learn how to operate uh, DOS and, uh, you know, move a mouse and things like that. That are we in the, in the same moment of time, uh, but this is going to have same, if not bigger impact to society and uh, business as well. Chell, mm. uh, we're going to stop I here for the part one. Uh, for all of you listening, so we will continue with the part two that is coming up um, uh, soon. Uh, so in this episode, we were looking at the hype and uh, does everybody need to have an enterprise generative AI strategy? The next one where we meet, we, be, we will be talking about how to operationalize um, generative AI in an enterprise and what are the pitfalls uh, that you need to uh, avoid. And with us, we have uh, Chell Carlson, who is the head of uh, data science strategy at Domino Data Lab. Chell, uh, thank you very much for um, this first part and uh, uh, looking forward to reconnect for the second part um, on the upcoming uh, episode. Thank you very much for having me. Great pleasure.